we invited uh, Steve Lonhart, um, Lonhart, I just messed that name up, to come up and give a talk. So Steve has been a marine ecologist for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary since 2002. He is one of the, he's a senior scientist for their assignment program, their, their monitoring network program. Um, basically that means he gets to do a lot of diving and a lot of research out in our base. He has a wealth of knowledge and he has a, he's been kind of connected to the aquarium for a very long time, but I'll, I'll kind of let him explain more on that. He'll probably do a better job introducing himself than me. So without further ado, let's have Steve Water come up. Folks hear me? Yeah. Okay. Usually, uh, loudness is not an issue with me. I'm loud now. If I get too loud, please let me know. I might drift closer and your ears are going to get blown out. But um, thanks for having me. Uh, as James pointed out, um, my name is Steve Monhart. I work at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And I've been there since 2002. And what he was referring to my uh, linkage to the aquarium is that when I was initially hired by the sanctuary, I was actually hired as a contractor, and at the time, the aquarium and the sanctuary had an agreement whereby I was funded by NOAA money, so my salary was paid for by the government as a contractor, but they didn't have a mechanism to hire contractors with benefits. And so at the time, uh, Chris Harold, uh, who many of you probably know quite well, um, and the uh, aquarium agreed to have my, not only myself, but uh, three other people hired on as aquarium employees. So we actually got our paychecks from the aquarium, but it was money coming from the government. And so I used to come over here in this very room once a month and meet with uh, Chris's team, and I see some familiar faces. And so that lasted for, um, it, was, it was supposed to last only a, a year or two, but typical government, you know, converting a contractor to an FTE took forever. And finally, when the aquarium said, look, these guys are about to vest, we got to kick them out because <laughs> five years is coming up, then things move quickly and, and, uh, and we were converted over to uh, feds. So anyway, so I, I, I have fond memories of, of being here at the aquarium and working with folks in the uh, conservation science group. I think it maybe has a different name now. Um, but anyways, um, uh, been here quite a bit, and actually one of my co-workers, Chad King, is one of your colleagues in terms of divers who do the shows. Uh, he's Wednesday at 11 o'clock, I believe, every other week. And so I did quite a bit of work with Chad in the field. So when I was asked to give a, uh, a talk, um, I wasn't sure what to talk about, and uh, James was nice enough to pass along your pretty extensive uh, like 80 page packet of information that you get and, and I was pretty impressed by that. that I mean it covers a lot of stuff, I mean some of it was you know well, this is how you should stand and smile and make sure you're making eye contact and all that, which was kind of helpful too, I mean when you're giving a talk it's all good stuff to know but the information in the packet related to the species and some of the community interactions I was really impressed um, by that. And so you guys have uh, clearly someone's done a lot of work and, and provided you with information. I also noticed there's links to lots of different. Is that you? Awesome. Good job. I also noticed that there were, there were links um, to uh, a variety of websites, uh, Jim Watanabe stuff right across the, the, the corner here at Hopkins Marine Station, some of our links on the Simon Network that I'll, I'll talk about. And so um, Given that you had all this information, I, I essentially decided to talk about some things that are, for the most part, not in your packet, so I'm not repeating things, but um, feel free, as I'm going through any of this, to just you know, shout out, hey Steve, I've got a question about this, I may or may not be able to answer it. If I can't answer it, George, who is my graduate uh, student, or he was, as a graduate student, he was my teaching assistant when I first started diving in kelp forests. Fine. I'm and, older than you. Okay. Yeah. 
Not so enough. if I can't answer, George will know, and, I'll, and I'll, he'll be my lifeline. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, I'll, if, if, and if I can't give you the right answer, I'll, I'll give you a really good sounding wrong answer. So at least be entertaining. I like that. Okay, so tonight I'm going to cover essentially four areas. Um, I'm going to talk about the sanctuary assignment just really briefly. For some of, many of you, I hope it's going to be review, but for some of you, it'll be new information. And then I'll very briefly talk about kelp force, uh, maybe a couple of things that um, are not necessarily covered in, in your handout. And then I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about monitoring our kelp forests and how I've been involved with the state's efforts, the sanctuary's efforts, local academics' efforts, NGOs' efforts. I mean, there are a lot of people who are very interested in this iconic uh, ecosystem that occurs throughout the area um, in, uh, within the sanctuary along the central coast of California. And then I'm going to finish up with um, sea star wasting syndrome and urchins. And those are two things that have been in the media a fair amount over the last couple of years. You may have heard some about it, you may have questions about it, and hopefully I'll be able to pass along some information to, to help you understand that stuff. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about the sanctuaries. Um, hopefully you know that within NOAA, there's the National Ocean Service, just like we have a National Weather Service, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and within the Ocean Service, one of the place-based um, uh, programs that protects areas is the Sanctuaries Program. And all the circles here indicate where you've got different sanctuaries throughout the United States and in a Great Lake. There are freshwater, there is a freshwater sanctuary currently, there's probably going to be another in the next couple of years. And um, not only on the continental U.S., but also out in the Hawaiian Islands. And recently, you may have heard about um, President Obama had expanded um, the Papahanaumokuakea National <laughs> But that, that's, that's actually a national marine um, monument that was enacted by George um, Bush Jr. when he was leaving office um, through the Antiquities Act, which doesn't require an act of Congress to pass. They can just, and that's usually what happens at the end of terms. Uh, George Sr., um, essentially, his legacy uh, was, oh, you got a laser pointer? Oh. Well, so George Sr., when he was leaving office um, through the Sanctuaries Program, he was the one who actually um, wrote and signed off on Monterey Bay becoming a National Marine Sanctuary. Okay, is that, is that better? Okay. All right, um, thank you. And so what, I, what I'm showing here is, in, in blue is the original boundary for the monument that George Jr. established, and at the time became the biggest of the areas managed by the Marine Sanctuary Program, but it wasn't the largest sort of protected area. Well, Obama just basically exploded the whole thing, went from about 130,000 square miles to almost 600,000 square miles of protected area, and is now the largest conservation area on the planet. So um, it's, it's an area that, for good or for bad, doesn't have a lot of people there, so it's actually in fairly good shape right now, and the protections that are being put in place will hopefully maintain that um, into the future. So that just happened in August, and we're probably going to see some other things that, both on land and in sea, that will be uh, protected as the final months of the Obama presidency um, tick away. So I just want to show folks the, the, the outline for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, back in 2009, we added Davidson Seamount, um, which is about 70 miles offshore of Cambria. This is an extinct volcano, one of the very first seamounts described um, that people had ever discovered. And it's a place where every time uh, Ambari goes out there with the Western Flyer, drops an ROV over, it seems like they find something new that no one has ever seen before. Um, so it's not just like, oh, it's we used to see these down in Baja. It's like, no, no one knows what this thing is. So it's a really cool place because although it's very difficult logistically to get to and to go down that deep because it is, it's, you know, 3,000 plus um, feet below the surface, um, 
it has an incredible set of corals that are down there, deep water corals, and organisms associated with them that are just um, sort of mind blowing. It's, it's really feel like you're on another planet. But the sanctuary, most of us just know our little sort of section down here in Monterey Bay, but it extends north of the San Francisco Bay entrance all the way down to Cambria and many places up to 40 miles offshore and encompasses a, an incredible diversity of habitats. We have a massive submarine canyon, we've got this extinct volcano, as you move closer you've got a continental shelf, a slope, you've got an estuary at Elkhorn Slough, part of the Elkhorn Slough estuary is under the, the, the management is under the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and then we've got um, all this incredible coastline that most people are familiar with in terms of rocky intertidal or sandy beaches. Now, programmatically, the sanctuary, like most places that are, are place-based conservation, have um, an area where you've got education and outreach, and some of the folks who work on our team work closely with the aquarium, um, with other groups to sort of get the message out about marine conservation. We have an operations group that helps uh, get, keep everything running, the boats, the, the uh, cars, make sure the lights are on. Um, resource protection, these are the guns and badges kind of people. Some of these guys I don't even really recognize them on site because they're kind of these undercover guys that aren't really working for us in terms of they're not necessarily our employees, they're Office of Law Enforcement guys. And some of them truly are um, undercover. And so we only know that there's somebody out there, but we don't know who they, what they look like. So it's, it's kind of the clandestine part of it. And then the part that I'm uh, working with is the research arm of the sanctuary, and specifically, mostly with this little thing that we've got off the side that's a subset of the research program that is uh, Simon, the Sanctuary Integrated Monitoring Network. And Simon is a program that, it, Way back when, again, a, a strong linkage with the aquarium, with Julie Packard, back in 2000, um, the sanctuary was only eight years old at the time, and Bill Duros came in as the superintendent, and there was a lot of interest in, in sort of thinking about how can we, as a sanctuary, wrap our heads around all the incredible research and monitoring that's taking place in this area by academic groups, by government agencies, state, federal, local, by NGOs. How do we kind of manage that and use it to effectively uh, protect our resources? And so Simon was, uh, was born of that. There was actually, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, there was the agreement between the aquarium to hire us as employees, but we were getting our funds from NOAA. And so the Simon staff initially did basically three things. Um, one was we would support existing monitoring programs. Back then, you know, this is 2000, and when I started 2002, um, we were sort of uh, flush with money. We had settlement money from energy companies, we had Packard Foundation funding, and all that money was used to spend to do research <coughs> and monitoring. So my job basically was, at the time, to release requests for proposals, get all these proposals in, and with a, a team of advisors, uh, scientists, figure out who can do the work the best, and who can get us the best science, and then give them money to go out and do science. So back then, anytime I walked in the room, there were always people flocking towards me. Because I, I, I always felt like the bell of the ball, because it was, oh, they, they don't necessarily like me, they like the money I represent. So that took a little while to get used to, and then eventually when the money dried up, that also dried up, but, but anyways, um, we, we did fund a lot of um, new programs and existing programs, and usually the effort, the idea was, if someone's doing something already, why don't we have them slightly modify what it is they're doing to help us actually address a sanctuary-related question? So that was modifying existing programs. We found out that there were some questions that no one could answer, so we funded those, those were new ones. And then we did things like, we had the docents from the Point Lobos um, State Park who had, uh, who had been doing, and still are doing, sea otter counts. And they said, hey, we've got these binders and binders of monthly sea otter survey data, and we don't know what to do with them. Right? And, I, and they had been trained by USGS to collect these data. And so we worked with them and funded basically them to to, we created a database for them, and then they entered in all that information and now provide that information 
um, electronically, so now other people can actually see the data. Tim Tinker, other folks who work with sea otters in the area can actually go and look at those data and use them to, however they want to use them, as opposed to it's literally sitting on a shelf in a binder that only the docents ever looked at. So that was sort of rescuing historical data. And we, we've done that with a couple of others, people who were retiring and had information that was in a filing cabinet, and we digitized a lot of it. Then the idea was take all that information and somehow disseminate it um, out. And, and I'll be honest, initially our goal was to make our own lives easier working within the sanctuary. And people ask, you shouldn't talk about this selfish message. I go, but it's true. We said, why not do something that's going to make our lives easier? And as, as a bonus, if we make it publicly available, it might help other people. But we're not taking the role of, we're going to make everybody happy and create the perfect widget that everyone loves, because those never get built. So we instead said, we're going to build something that we use and if other people can use it, all the better. And it turned out, that actually ended up being a pretty good strategy. So the Simon website, this is the home page uh, from uh, yesterday. There's basically a couple of areas. There's news items. You can look at habitats and, and issues and species groups, both in, in this case, the Channel Islands, at Cordell Bank, at the Greater Fairlands, or Monterey Bay all four of those sanctuaries in California, and eventually we'll have the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary in there, the last of the sanctuaries that's in the West Coast region of sanctuaries. And there's a lot of information about those different topics and those different issues, but what we found was there were three areas that initially we were really interested in getting our staff, to have our staff um, look at and at their fingertips, which was initially the project highlights, which are research and monitoring programs. This is the who, what, when, where, why of research and monitoring that's taking place in the sanctuary, and specifically those projects that likely are going to have an impact in how we manage the sanctuary itself. So we don't have everything in there, but we have projects that are important to the sanctuary. Then we had uh, the photo library. I used to get just bombarded with emails, people saying, hey, I need a shot of this rockfish. Oh, I need a shot of this. I'm creating a little newsletter. I'm doing something. And, and so I spent a lot of my time, and Chad too, because we were basically the only guys who could take pictures underwater. And they're like, this is great. We have all these pictures. Well, we created a photo library so they can just search it and, and look to their heart's content and grab whatever it is that they want as opposed to us doing the work for them. And then we had a species database that basically captures a lot of the nat natural history that's associated with the species. And right now we're up to 172 species. And this covers the algae, the invertebrates, the fishes, the birds, and the mammals. And we started with the species that you're most likely going to see if you're just walking <coughs> along the shore, or if you're going for a snorkel, or you're doing a scuba dive. So a lot of these species are ones that are very obvious. And it turns out that photo library is just hammered with traffic. We have people going there all the time because these are images taken while we're on the government clock and are therefore in the public domain. So we don't say, we're going to charge you 20 bucks for this little thing or we want our name splashed all over it. And people love that. Okay? So they love the fact that they don't have to do any of that. And so we have a lot of traffic in our photo library. We also... Um, Speaking of apps, we uh, at, at one point we're saying, well, you know, why not have this stuff available on our phone? And, and I should mention, although he's not here, Scott Chapman, who probably almost all of you know and certainly the divers know, Scott, um, uh, way when we were developing all this stuff, is one of the architects of a lot of this stuff. So I actually work quite closely with Scott, and he maintains our Simon website on the weekend. So when you think he's not working at the aquarium, he's still working. And so I, I don't know how the guy does, especially with a, a second little kid. Uh, but anyways, one of the things we did is we, we with his assistance and a, and, a, and a developer over in Silicon Valley, created an app. First it was on the iOS platform called Seaphoto. And just uh, recently it's become available on the Android platform as well. And so you can go and download CFO, it's free, it's um, a free app, and there's over 550 species on it right now, there's a lot of species, lots of photos, we try to have at least 
one if not two or three photos per species, usually particularly if they're variable in how they look or different um, stages of their life cycle. And then um, information, natural history information about those, basically drawing from our databases on the website. And, and so now you can go in and say, I can't tell the difference between a Brant's cormorant and a pelagic cormorant. Well, you can, with this app, you can do that. Or if you're a diver in between dives on a, on a dive charter and you had access, you're sitting right off of Maccabee here, something like that, on a dive charter boat, you go, was that a blue or black rockfish? Uh, I'm not really sure. You're trying to explain it to somebody else. Just pop it up, it's in there. You can do that. So anyways, I encourage anyone who wants yet another resource, <laughs> as if what you have wasn't enough, <coughs> to download the free app. And then, of course, um, visit the Sanctuary uh, Simon website, which is sanctuarysimon.org. Um, I remember I, I, I gave a talk several years ago to the um, Kelp Climbers Club, a, a dive club, a local dive club. Maybe some of you might be members. And that the president invited me back like six months later to give another talk. And he says, you know, I, I got to tell you, um, I got in trouble after you showed me that website. I said, what? He goes, well... You know, that night, uh, when I got home, uh, I had my laptop, and so I started looking through there, and looking at the pictures, and looking at the species, and, and I'm thinking to myself, well, what's the problem here? That's, well, that's what I want everyone to do. And he goes, well, the problem came at about 3 in the morning when my wife hit me in the ribs and said, turn off the damn computer! Because he'd been on it for like four hours straight. So there is a, a tremendous amount of information on there, some of which you might be find useful as tidbits of information uh, in your presentations, or for those of you who are diving and maybe just want to learn a little bit more or see something different, or see something um, about the species you're working with. So anyways, sanctuarysimon.org. Okay, so that's that's the uh, sanctuary overview, and then I just want to, this quote's in your um, is in your information packet, but I love showing this because you know Charles Darwin when he was you know exploring these areas, he wasn't a scuba diver, he wasn't even a snorkeler, right? This is all stuff that was coming up based on nets being dragged, buckets being lowered over, scraping the sea bottom and bringing stuff up grabbing stuff that you could reach with your arms. And he realized that this underwater forest truly is an incredible, incredibly diverse um, system. And it's very analogous to you know, a regular uh, a forest. But in fact, you know, he's recognized that there might even be more species in these kelp forests as compared to many of the forests he was used to, at least in temperate systems. So if you look at the globe, there's basically kelp um, in temperate and northern latitudes. There are some in the tropics, but they tend to be in really uh, deep water. There's some kelp that occur in, in, in over 100 meters deep in very clear but warm water in the tropics. Um, the species that you guys are most familiar with is Macrocystis, uh, the genus for the giant kelp, and Nereocystis, the genus for bull kelp. And you see they occur Alaska down into Baja, on the uh, west coast of South America and in areas of Europe and Asia, Australia. And so you can really find kelp forests all over the place. And these are all algae that are within the order Laminariales. Now, one of the things that people, you know, when you're in grade school or even high school, or at least when I was, you got hammered in your head that, well, the most productive places are tropical rainforests. You know, that's where all the production is. And what I want to show you is that we've gone from boreal forest to temperate down to tropical forest. Those are the ones with asterisks. And then we've got algae in these last three categories. Now when you look at giant kelp, its net primary productivity, which is, a, is basically how many grams of carbon are produced in one square meter over the course of a year. Okay. And that's on the order of between 600 and 1300, or 700 and 1300 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And that's comparable to tropical rainforests. And in some cases can be even greater. But one of the big differences is the standing crop is very low. And so that, what that means is, and it's something you all know, even if you don't realize it, kelp forests have a lot of turnover. They're basically turning out a lot of production, but there's not a lot of 
kelp that sits around for years and years and years, like you might see with a tree in a forest that's there for decades, if not hundreds of years. So we've got a very dynamic system because of that. There's a lot of growth, it's very rapid, produces a lot of nutrients, and those nutrients in the form of kelp fronds and pieces are transported to many places. Sometimes they're transported on the beach and it smells and you don't like it because now where you're walking it stinks to high heaven. But there are lots of terrestrial organisms that are making use of that subsidy that's now on the beach. Sometimes that kelp is going offshore, down canyons, and, in, and is supplying a subsidy to deep water communities that otherwise wouldn't have that because algae doesn't grow that deep. So the production of a kelp forest is not just staying in the kelp forest. That litter, that leaf litter, you can think of it like leaf litter, is actually being transported into lots of places. There's been some really interesting studies like up in Alaska, places where there's not a lot of vegetation to start off with in certain places, where you can find the kelp carbon and nitrogen signal in things like the birds and the foxes because they're feeding on the organisms that are feeding on that kelp on land. So there's a kelp signature in terrestrial mammals. Okay, not, not just the marine mammals, but terrestrial ones. So giant kelp, um, it's the iconic symbol of the aquarium, right? That's the logo. You've, you've all seen it. You, people are diving in it. We've got these incredible little nematocysts that are coming off the growing symmetry, the apical symmetry, and they start off really small, kind of nondescript, and then we get these really incredible kelp force. This is Chad, uh, Chad King, who I said is the uh, Wednesday 11 a.m. Uh, uh, feeding show diver, um, and my colleague. Uh, we were last week diving in Point Lobos, and you know, in a kelp forest, you really do feel you're in a forest. Instead of birds flying through the trees, you have fish flittering through the kelp. Um, and it's just, it's a really cool thing to do. All of you divers know how cool it is. Now, bull kelp, um, we don't see here in Monterey Bay very often. It does occur. You have to either go north or south and you start seeing uh, more bull kelp. But bull kelp, Nereocystis, um, is really interesting because unlike giant kelp, which can persist, you know, a couple of years, you know, so it's a, it's a perennial, but it's sort of a short-term perennial. Bull kelp are annuals. So they go from nothing to being 20, 30 meters long, all in the course of a few months, and in one, within one year, that's their entire life cycle. So you go from something that's microscopic to that's huge, and you might see, you know, I, I was always getting in trouble because I picked that thing up and chase after my siblings with it, like a big bullwhip. And my parents weren't happy about it, but I thought this was the coolest thing, and there's weapons on the beach. I don't even have to buy these things. And they're all over the place. They can take one away, I'll just find another one. So anyways, uh, these things are amazing, and, and the nematocysts here, instead of having multiple nematocysts like you see in, in the giant kelp, they've just got one single float here. And so I wanted to I wanted to give you a little bit of tip, tidbit of information about this one, even though it's not always on display in the aquarium. It's, it's very much a seasonal thing in the kelp forest tank. But people always ask me, or kids ask me especially, it's like, well, if you ran out of air while you were scuba diving, could you go and get one of those floater things and just pop them open and survive that way? And I said, well, for, for macrocystis for giant kelp, the composition of the gases in a nematocyst, in a float, an air bladder, or whatever you want to call it, is very similar to air. The oxygen is pretty close to about 20-21%, varies by day and night. The nitrogen is very similar, carbon dioxide is minuscule, and there's a few other sort of trace element gases in there. So it actually, if you could figure out a way to get those little bubbles in your mouth, you could breathe that, okay? Not so with bowl count. Okay. Okay. So this is we're, we're going back in time to get this information. So it's going to be kind of gruesome, but I want you guys to, to learn this stuff. So oxygen and, and carbon dioxide values vary over 24-hour <laughs> period because during the day it's obviously doing photosynthesis, so it's producing oxygen, it's sucking up CO2 to build sugars. It's producing oxygen as a byproduct. Of photosynthesis, and at night, 
there's no sunlight, so you're not photosynthesizing, and respiration sort of takes over, and now you're breaking down um, those sugars and you're releasing carbon dioxide. So these things vary over a 24-hour period, but when you look at bulk health, and this is work that was done in 1915, okay, the stuff that I'm going to tell you, there has been subsequent work with um, what we would consider more humane and um, possibly more elegant experimental apparatus, but I want to show you what they did back in 1915. This is up at the Puget Sound uh, Marine Station. They So this one uh, uh, researcher, Langdon, found that carbon monoxide ranged from about 1 to 12 percent and had an average value of 4 percent in that gas bladder of the bulk kelp. Okay, carbon monoxide, which you should know <coughs> binds very well to your hemoglobin, to your blood, and can cause death pretty rapidly. <coughs> Oxygen was about close to atmospheric. Atmospheric is 20.9, but is, is in that range. And when I was reading through the paper, I was like, going, how did this guy figure this out, right? Well, a guinea pig placed in a vessel through which kelp gas was passing died in less than 10 minutes. Death was not due to the absence of oxygen, for the gas contains about 18% of oxygen. A fresh gas was being continuously forced through the vessel. What he found was there was actually carbon monoxide binding to the blood, and he had a whole bunch of tests to demonstrate that the guinea pig suffocated, basically, because all that CO was binding to the hemoglobin and outcompeting the oxygen. <coughs> the guinea pig wasn't enough, though. Canary bird lived less than 15 seconds, and then a chicken died in about a minute, and then a chick did about the same. I was like, look, this guy is going through the whole farm. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was, it's, it's, it's gruesome, but you think about it. He was like, how do I find out what this gas is? They didn't have gas chromatographs and all these instruments that showed up, you know, 30, 40, 50 years later. He's like, well, I'll just have a pump that takes the gas from that chamber, and I'll move it into a chamber where I've got an animal. And then I'll look at the blood of the animal, because I know what happens when they get poisoned with carbon monoxide, and see if it matches, or if it's some other gas. And this guy, was he wasn't really a biologist. He was more of a, a cat, uh, gas um, uh, chemistry kind of guy. But anyways, that's the kind of stuff you'll see in the old literature. And this, no one, clearly no one wanted to, well, I think no one wanted to repeat these, but later on they figured out more elegant ways of using syringes, and you had instruments that could actually analyze the gas that's in there, and they found that, yes, indeed, there is carbon monoxide in these. Now, the question becomes, why isn't there carbon monoxide in giant kelp? And one of the hypotheses that's not been fully examined is that when the, when the alga is growing actively, that the carbon monoxide is basically a byproduct of growth, and that it's being actively produced as this byproduct. As soon as it reaches maturity and kind of stops, it's going to equilibrate with the gases around it. These bulbs, these nematocysts, these algae, you can think of as very um, slow sieves, and that the gases will equilibrate. That's how you get nitrogen in the system. Nitrogen is atmospherically at about 80%, it's about 80% of the water, it's about 80% in these seaweeds. And so the CO is going to basically dissolve out of these bulbs when they stop growing, and it's not replaced. So the idea is with macrocystis, or with giant kelp, it's a small volume, they grow relatively quickly, you'd have to be right in there while they're growing to see if you could even detect it, but when they were looking at these, they were looking at mature, individuals that had stopped growth and therefore felt that there was no CO in there. I think the experiments can be done pretty easily now. You can probably get an undergraduate to do this stuff now because the, the equipment's so cool. But I, I don't know of anyone who's doing that. So anyways, um, a piece of history that fortunately we're not repeating. Okay, so use that tidbit how you want. Maybe <laughs> don't breathe out of a bulk kelp bulb, but don't tell them how you know there's carbon monoxide in there. So use a little discretion. Okay. The next section is uh, talking about monitoring in our kelp forest. So we have a lot of monitoring that's taking place, 
And uh, PSCO is one of the groups, the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans, is a group that includes scientists from UC Santa Barbara, UC Santa Cruz, Stanford, and um, Oregon State University. And that consortium has been funded through a variety of Packard Foundation, Gordon Moore Foundation, a variety of sources, that initially they were looking at large-scale, long-term changes in kelp force and intertidal systems, just for the sake of monitoring to see how things will or will not change over time. Well, when the state, um, when California was getting into um, updating the marine protected areas and, and following up with the Marine Life Protection Act, a lot of the sites that PSCO had been studying fell inside of or outside of the marine protected areas that were established in 2007 in Central California. And here they're represented by these red and blue polygons and all the white bubbles indicate where sampling was being done by PSCO. And so here's a blow up of the peninsula. And you can see we have a lot of MPAs going from Monterey around to PG into Asilomar and along Pebble Beach, down into Carmel Bay and then south from Lobos. And so the, the idea was let's gather the same kind of information inside and outside of these protected areas and see how things diverge or don't diverge based on the management actions that are taking place by the state and those related to extraction. So whether it's fishing or invertebrates or, or you know, whatever, that, that resources are being removed. Clearly, our jurisdiction overlaps with this, and we're very interested in monitoring these resources as well because we have a responsibility for their management. So, <clears throat> just to kind of zoom in on uh, kind of PG, uh, Silomar area, if you look at um, this peninsula, basically these kelp beds, which is what the green is, the light green is sort of kelp's been there at some point over the last 20 years. The really dense green colors are kelp's pretty persistently there. And anywhere you see a red dot, that was a place that you could sample. And so we decided to, to randomly allocate our sampling efforts. These are these polygons. And within each of these polygons, you're either doing fish surveys or benthic transects. And the fish surveys are focusing only on the fishes, whereas the benthic transects are collecting information on what this, the bottom is made of, what the relief of that bottom is, what kinds of algae are, are on that, what kinds of invertebrates are on that, and also counting the large canopy forming kelp and all the sub canopy kelp as well. So a lot of information is being collected in those benthic transects. <laughs> Here's just another view of those. For the fish transects, there's four different depth zones, five meters, which is like the inner edge of the kelp bed, out to about 20 meters, which is typically where kelp kind of peters out in terms of depth. Sometimes it's not that deep might be sand out there. And so we capture this information, divers go out there, they're searching along transect tapes and fixed volumes of water that they're trained to uh, sample. They're all trained every summer. It's where I actually see George most of the time because he's doing work out at Hopkins and I'm training a bunch of new people to learn how to do this stuff properly so we have consistency in the data. And they have to not only identify which fish they see in that volume of water, but they also have to, in some cases, identify if it's male or female, which is pretty easy for those species that are, are, have separate sexes and different morphologies. And then they also have to size them, and that's where a lot of people kind of fail. <laughs> and, and people go, well, how do you know? How do you know? I said, we've got a lot of fake fish. We call it the, the slalom course, and divers go out, and they, uh, the fish are out there, there are different species, they have numbers on them, and then you go, okay, I saw fish 138, I said it was a senorita, and my size estimate was 10 centimeters. And then when they come back after they've been diving and have all this information on about 50 different fish, we see how good they were. And if they're within about two or three centimeters on average, then they can collect the data. If it's not, you can't come out and collect data. You gotta work more. So that's our litmus test for getting good data in terms of the size. And this is essentially one of the few ways that you can collect information on fishes that doesn't require shooting them or hooking them or netting them. Um, you can do it with video and lasers, and that's, that's really good too, um, but it's tough to send an ROV through a kelp bed. A scuba diver can shimmy and shake through it and can follow the contours, whereas something that's got a, an umbilicus up to the surface has a hard time doing that. We don't have mini subs yet that can 
can do that stuff yet, but um, that might happen in the future. So here's, we have two divers kind of zooming along. One's doing the benthic fishes, their buddy is slightly ahead of them and, and a couple meters off the bottom doing midwater fishes. We even have people who are doing the canopy of the kelp itself uh, to look at the recruitment of, in particular, young of the year rock fishes that come in. We've had a couple of really incredible years, these last couple of years of, of young of the year rock fish coming in. And so, uh, no one likes to do canopies because, you know, it's just, you gotta have an empty stomach and a steel stomach and just, because it's moving and it's slopping and, and so, we try to get the, the, the undergrads who, <laughs> who have more stamina and fortitude than I do. I, I go, oh, this is canopy day, ah, sorry, right, I'm not feeling up for diving, but. <clears throat> now, on the benthic side of things, that's where I actually do most of my work, is on the benthic side, is we've got two different techniques that we use to sample information. One is, they're both based on 30 meter transects, and one is you cruise along the transect tape, and on one meter to either side of that tape, you're counting everything that's on a preset list of species. Most of those species are ones you know. There's a lot of sea stars, there's some anemones, there's some snails, there's some crabs. These are species that were selected because one, they're usually abundant and easy to identify, and two, they play a particular role in the kelp forest community, and it's usually an important role. So they're indicators for the community as a whole. So that's what we call the swath transect. We collect a lot of information on that. Used to be in the past, we had urchins on there, and it wasn't a big deal because we'd only come across a few urchins on a transect. Now we've actually created a, an entire separate diver who just counts urchins and, and the few abalone that are out there because the urchin numbers have increased, but that's the, the fourth part of the talk. Here's a diver, for example, going along. There's the meter tape. This is... Um, at Bluefish Cove at Lobos. And so there's a slate, and they're looking all along there for these, uh, the swath folks have about 30 to 35 species that they're targeting, um, and they're making density counts of those. They're done at the same locations. We have GPS uh, units. We don't have a, a spike in a rock or anything, so it's not the exact same transect, but it's within a few meters, and Based on the fact that I find things that have Pisco labeled on them a year or two later, I'm always very confident that we're right on the same spot. And I'll pull up a meter tape and go, Bob lost this two years ago. And it's like, here it is, you know. So, um, and then the other technique that we use is a uniform point contact. So, a lot of things are hard to count. Like, you can see a sea star and you can count it. It's like, okay, there's an individual. But how do you count a sponge? If there's a little separation between this big lump of sponge here and one over here, is that two sponges? Is that one little sponge the same as this big sponge over here, even though it's five times the area over there? So for, that, for those kinds of organisms that are considered modular organisms as opposed to things that are unitary, like we're unitary, modular things we use this point intercept technique in every meter. You basically go where the tape is, it's marked like here, this yellow tape over it, and you go, what's underneath it? So our divers get trained to identify anything <coughs> under that point. And people go, how can you do that? There's so many things out there. And we go, well, some of the categories are pretty general, like sponge. Okay? So that, that gets rid of all this stuff. Well, I don't know which sponge, I don't know which sponge it is either, but I know it's a sponge. So that's, we, can, we have, in some cases, the category is the entire phylum. Okay, we're not differentiating amongst different species of sponges. Other things are two specific species and they have to identify them. There's about 70 things people have to know for that one. That's, that's a harder one in terms of what you need to know but it's very methodical. Every meter, I just, I'm just i like working on the railroad, just going every meter, just doing something. So a lot of people like that method. Now, local places we can get to with small boats, but down in Big Sur, you saw we had some places down south of Point Sur, going all the way down to Cambria. We use the Fulmar, which is the sanctuary 67-foot aluminum catamaran vessel, research vessel, the RV Fulmar. And normally what we do, this is, a, this is Plaskett Rock, beautiful calm day in the Big Sur in the summer, not common, but uh, it does happen. 
And what we do is we launch inflatables. We usually have two inflatables. We launch them off the, mm -hmm. off the um, Fulmar, and then we take those inflatables and divers, and here are some happy divers because it is so calm. There's the Fulmar anchored in the background with plastic rock. This is very close to J Cove. And um, then we deploy the divers. We have GPS units. We go to the same exact spot where we always deploy the divers and then collect the information. We do that year after year after year. Many of these sites were, the, the data were collected before the state implemented the marine protected areas. And, and many of them have continued after that, and there was actually a bit of an expansion when the state implemented their MPAs. So, there are two things that people use um, to talk about the data thus far. Um, we have one publication in 2000, uh, well this was actually in 2010, but the 2007-2008 data are available, are, are the sort of baseline characterization are represented in this um, publication and are available online through the o California Ocean Science Trust. And then the OST, a few years ago, some of you may have even attended that conference that was um, over here at the, uh, whatever, it's the Marriott or the, or the Hyatt or whatever, not the Hyatt, the Hilton. Anyways, the big con the Monterey Bay Conference Center where they had an update on what was going on in the Central Coast. Most of that information was setting the stage for here are the data that we have at the, at the onset, at the implementation of these marine protected areas. In 10 years, we're going to be comparing the newly collected data to those data and see whether things are converging, diverging, going up, down, etc. Between areas with and without marine protected areas. Okay? So some of the changes that we're expecting to see may take even longer. Do you guys know how, how old do rockfish live? Decades, right? I mean, some of them can be over 100 years old. So for some species, some of the changes are not going to be captured in a decade. Other species, you might see some differences. As they're already seeing with the Channel Islands uh, MPAs that were implemented prior to 2007. Um, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, last phase. Sea star wasting syndrome, or disease, sea star wasting disease. Um, what is it? It's a disease that affects sea stars, both in the intertidal and the subtidal. Basically, when, you, when, when a star contracts it, it starts to waste away and dies. And in, in the case of what happened most recently, led to what's called a mass mortality event, an MME. <clears throat> what do they look like? They form lesions, and I'll show you, show you some pictures. They get deflated, they disarticulate, they actually rip their own rays off mm. and eventually dissolve. That happens in the span of a couple of days from the onset of the disease. There, there's a densovirus currently that's associated with it and has been shown to transmit the disease, but the actual degradation of tissue is usually due to actual bacterial infection. Um, dead sea stars, when they die, they all pretty much die in the same way. They start to dissolve, and, and um, the ossicles that are being held by, together by tissue, as the tissue dies, they basically turn into sand. Um, so you could be looking at a star and not sure whether it has an infection or it's just old, or you know, there's some other reason bacteria are going crazy in there. Why did it happen in 2013? That densovirus was found in museum specimens as far back as the 1940s. So the virus is not something that came from Mars, didn't come over with the radiation from Fukushima. It wasn't something that a mad scientist got. It's been around for a long time. Now why 2013? They're not sure because when it happened, it happened along the entire west coast of the US, but it didn't happen synchronously. Certain, it happened in Washington, then Central California, Oregon was sort of spared for a couple of years, and then it happened in Oregon. And so it wasn't like a wave moving in one direction or the other. It wasn't like everybody got sick all at once. It was very um, odd in terms of its spatial uh, dynamics. <clears throat> Talk about how widespread it is. We've had mass mortality events in the past, usually associated with El Ninos, but those were more limited in their spatial scale. So. Um, 83, 84, we had a really big El Nino, the 97, 98 El Nino. There were die-offs of echinoderms, mostly in Southern California because temperatures were really elevated down there. 
This happened, you know, as far north as Alaska. So this is unprecedented in terms of a die-off or a mass mortality event. <clears throat> and then people say, well, how long is it going to be before I see those extra-large size, pizza-sized sunflower stars? And, you know, it's going to be several years, probably. I mean, I, last year people were saying, oh, we're seeing them about the size of, you know, uh, silver dollar, a little bit bigger, maybe like a small tea plate. Now they're kind of the size of a salad plate, the ones that are surviving. And so this big around might be another couple of years. And if you want more information, um, there's a great website, uh, Pacific Rocky Intertidal. If you just um, type in all one word, Pacific Rocky Intertidal, or if you even just type in sea star wasting disease, that website's going to come up. That's hosted up at UC Santa Cruz, and they have information from throughout the three uh, western states. So here's a, uh, this is from a paper that just came out a couple months ago, just to kind of show you. Over here on the, on the left-hand side, you've got a crack up in, uh, I believe this is Oregon, no, sorry, this is Washington, packed full of sea stars. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, you've got sea stars that's healthy up top. Then it starts forming these lesions. And then there, it's actually disarticulating. There, it's sort of ripping off a ray. And then there's just overall, what I call it again, a full zombie mode. They're just kind of wasting away. Um, they're flopping around. The two feet aren't attaching to anything. And they just eventually will dissolve within, within a, a day or two. So this is what... These are some shots. So this was uh, down in Big Sur when we were diving down there in 2013 and from Hopkins. Um, so this is what I call the pretzel. So oftentimes sea stars will wrap their rays around prey and they're using that as leverage to try to open something up, whether it's a muscle or, or a barnacle or something. But here they're wrapped on themselves. They're twisting on themselves, which oftentimes leads to the next phase where a ray rips itself off. So this is in the process of ripping that ray off, and you're seeing uh, uh, guts and gonads basically exposed there, all that golden tissue, and you can see a lot of sort of um, white bacterial films and just a loose, uh, flaccid star. Here's a bat star, um, part of its uh, stomach sort of sitting out there, just degraded, and sometimes we even see another bat star going in and, and feeding on the other one, or there'd be a bunch of snails in there. Um, so, really, and we're still seeing a few examples like this, but again, sea stars die in sort of a similar way, so it's hard to tell whether it's viral, virally related or something else. So I, I got some uh, data yesterday um, from uh, PISCO, and these are data up through last summer. They're, we're still in the process of collecting the 2016 data. The field season's not over, but these are data from uh, 1999, um, through 2015. This is for the sunflower star. What you're seeing is the number per meter squared. So this is low, right? You know, we're not even seeing a tenth of a sunflower star per meter squared. We sample 60 square meters, so that's why you're seeing a couple of them and the numbers are small. But the main point is, they're kind of bouncing around, bouncing around, and then a few years ago, there was a spike in a couple of the sites. But then notice in 2014 and 15, it all crashes to zero at most sites, and then if some of them are still at zero and only a couple of them, we're seeing a few of the small sunflower stars. So the data that were collected clearly demonstrate a crash in terms of the number of sunflower stars, and this is throughout sites in Monterey, Carmel, Big Sur, it doesn't matter where you were in the central coast. This is what we're looking for now, and a little bit bigger. So this is in 2015. This is a juvenile sunflower star. These are one centimeter um, little marks here. There's the tip of a bat star. So these are these little guys. And so we're hoping these little guys are going to survive, and they're going to grow and eventually become the extra large pizzas that we're all used to and storm around and, and feed on things. Hyzaster giganteus, the giant spine star, again, number per meter squared, higher densities than sunflower stars are more common. Same time frame, 1999 through 2015. A lot of variation, but almost all sites you see drop down to very low numbers or to zero. Again, now we've seen more and more of the large stars actually survive. They were in cracks or crevices or they just weren't visible to the divers, but we've seen some big guys that are sitting around that clearly survived 
the disease. They can't grow that fast. So that's an example of the big one. We still see some of these big um, Pisaster giganteus out and about. And then um, a lot of these showed up, particularly at the breakwater and the harbor and in, intertidally in, in a lot of areas of California and Oregon in the subsequent years. And some people were hypothesizing that there was a relationship between this increase of little recruits and the death of the adults. And so um, if you look at this graphic, I just wanted to, this is from uh, Eric, Dr. Eric Sanford up at UC Davis, um, and I, I modified it slightly. But basically, if you look at the upper black line in blue text, that talks about Pisaster reproduction. So if you think about what was happening for settlement in the summer of 2013 when we had the outbreak of the disease, those individuals were based on the development of gonads back in September, December of 2012, then the sperm and eggs being released, larvae being in the water column for several months, and then settling out in July and October. So you don't have this automatic adults die, babies show up. There's a lag, okay? And so we've got all these settlers that are being seen, but they clearly were from an event that predates the disease. So some people said, well, maybe as like a, a dying gesture, when the stars knew they were going to bite it, as they're ripping their rays off, the eggs and sperm go everywhere. And I go, well, you know, abalone, they get injured, they do that. You know, they get injured, they say, hey, I'm dumping everything, man. I'm going to bleed out here in a little bit, so I'm just going to get rid of everything. Hopefully I get some progeny out of this. But that's not the case for the sea stars, okay? So I want to kind of dispel that myth. And then when you look down below here at the timeline of sea star wasting syndrome, you had it showing up in Washington in June. We started seeing it in sort of the fall, winter of, in, in California, December 13. And then Oregon showed up almost a full year later. So there's this disconnect between the timing of reproduction and the onset of disease. So it doesn't quite match. Um, and so likely they're not actually related. Now, uh, a paper just came out that talked about, well, when you lose all these uh, big adult sea stars, that's going to change where muscle beds are. Muscle beds are, can go down further in the intertidal now. And there's likely less competition for the little guys who do show up. So it's possible that the lack of adults or lack of juveniles or lack of smaller stars is actually facilitating through reduced competition some of the stars that are making this. So survivorship might be higher, but it's not that the adults produce the eggs that produce the recruits that showed up one month later. It just doesn't work. Okay, so that was sea star wasting, and then we had this urchin outbreak, which um, a lot of people were like, well, what's going on? We we're seeing areas with just lots of urchins, and so this is a Nat Geo article Here's some stuff that was in the Herald and the, and the Sentinel up in Santa Cruz talking about sea stars. And now that the sea stars are dying and they're gone, all these urchins are just going through the roof. They've just exploded. And, and, and it's because the sea stars aren't there to feed on them. And so let me talk a little bit about what urchins do under normal circumstances. Okay? There's a large and rich literature looking at red and purple urchins in California and Oregon, and even to a certain extent Washington. Under normal conditions, you've got urchins living in cracks and crevices because lots of things like to eat urchins. Sheephead love to eat urchins. Big sunflower stars eat small urchins. Otters obviously eat urchins. There's multiple species that love to feed on urchins. So typically they're hidden away. If there's not enough drift kelp, or if the cracks and crevices can't hold them anymore because they're getting bigger, the crack doesn't change its size, but the urchin does. So you get crowding. You can get this. Now, this is a picture I took at the Pinnacles in 2011, okay, way before any, you know, sea star disease, anything was going on. So here was a hold fast that was just being overrun by these relatively small, kind of two centimeter, three centimeter urchins because there wasn't enough drift where they were. And so they're 
they got to feed. So they go out and they start storming around the bottom trying to feed on things like algae. And even though haptera of, of macrocystis are low on the preference scale, if that's all they got, they will definitely eat it. So let's look at purple urchin data. Again, this is average number per meter squared, virtually non-existent at a variety of sites, very low. They were there, but they're tucked in cracks and crevices. They're, they're cryptic. You don't see them. You'd have to use a crowbar and pry rocks apart to actually get to those urchins. We don't do that kind of sampling. So essentially non-existent. And then 2014, 2015, we've got this skyrocket. Okay. Look at red urchins. A little bit more because they're bigger than purple urchins. They're kind of more obvious to see. But still, very low densities. And then again, through the roof for purple. I mean, this is 25 per meter squared at one site. In one meter, okay? Uh -huh. I mean, a meter is this, you know, it's not that big. Versus for reds, where it's not even getting one per meter squared, on average. So anyways, clearly there's been an increase in urchins. No one is denying that. The question becomes, why is there an increase in urchins? So, we all know the story, kelp's happy by itself with nothing's around, it can photosynthesize, it can grow, happy as can be, but then if you've got urchins around, urchins like to feed on kelp, they put the kelp populations down, but then if otters are around, they like to feed on urchins, which has an indirect effect on the kelp, so the kelp, you have a nice kelp, healthy kelp forest, if you've got otters around, and then, if humans come in, they can directly impact otters by doing things like harvesting them for their pelts, which then can lead to urchin-dominated systems, and we also can have indirect effects through pollution, through disease, other things that are negatively impacting. So, yeah, so that's, hopefully all of you have probably read or even talked about this in your show. This is stuff that people have been uh, discussing and researching for quite some time. In this more recent sort of era, the sunflower star definitely feeds on urchins. Now the question becomes, how many urchins can a sunflower star eat? How many stars are out there relative to how many urchins are out there too? So if you had one eating two a day, but there were 2,000 urchins out there, it's not really going to do much of a, of a dent, at least not for a while. So. Yes, stars eat urchins. Is the lack of stars leading to this outbreak of urchins? Well, let's look. We've got this, this diagram here. If we take out the, ur the uh, urchin predators, you can get a picture like that. That's, I believe, in Southern California. And that's a lot of purple urchins out there. I mean, it's, that's an, what we call an urchin-dominated system. Okay? People say urchin barren. It's not barren. Okay, it's urchin dominated. So I, I, I prefer to use it. It's not being PC, it's being more accurate. When I hear the word barren, it's like there's nothing there. No, there's lots of coralline algae there, crustos, articulated. There's little snails, there's all kinds of things there. It's just dominated by urchins. So I call I, I prefer the term urchin dominated system. This is Coral Street a month ago, or yeah, barely a month ago. This is actually just a couple of weeks ago. So there's a couple of divers. We were going out um, to do some. Young of the rockfish surveys. A year ago, when I dove this site for something similar, you couldn't swim a straight line because there's so much giant kelp. Couldn't swim a straight line. And we saw one live macrocystis over a 45 minute dive. It was mostly cystocyra that chain bladder kelp. So there's a lot of purple urchins here. The big black ones are actually red urchins. And there's one of those big pies that said that's fine. Right. Notice there's not a lot of urchins around it. Um, they know better. <laughs> so, what are the factors that are driving these urchin populations? Well, clearly, there's recruitment pulses. All this information I've been talking about, I haven't even mentioned that they don't recruit every single year. In fact, most years they don't recruit in any significant numbers. So instead you get pulses. Okay? And why we get pulses, don't know. Then when you show up, so let's say you're there, you're a little guy, a lot of your survival is going to depend on is there kelp available. Last couple of years haven't been the best kelp years. How many others showed up? How much competition is there? 
How fast are you growing? Urchins have the incredible ability to shrink. So the very first sort of in-field tag urchin growth rate measurement studies, they shrink. And the guy's like, what's going on? I tag these things, they're alive, they should be getting bigger. And they can actually reabsorb a lot of that calcium carbonate and kind of, and just, and they just shrink. And then you feed them and they'll go, they'll get bigger. Pretty trippy. Um, and then of course, what predators are in the system? How, how many of them are there? What kind of habitat do you have where they can hide? So we're fortunate enough that we have a lot of very complex reef structure that provides nooks and crannies and crevices, and the urchins can hide in that. But if the crevice is, let's say, this big, when urchins are small, you can fit like 20 of them, 30 of them in there, no problem. But if they're feeding, they're going to get bigger, and if they get bigger, 20 won't fit in that crack anymore. You might only get three or four. So they get displaced. Do they get eaten? Well, predators are around, yes. And then there's disease. In Southern California, they're calling it the sort of balding syndrome because they get these black sort of bald patches on the urchins where there's no spines, and then they, 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 they die. So they're curious if that's going to become more prevalent and spread from Southern California to other areas. So anyways, there's a lot of factors that go into this, and that's not even talking about things like temperature and wave action, these environmental, these physical factors that can do lots of damage to urchins and their recruitment and their survivorship. So I'm almost done here, hang in there. This is one of the last data slides I'll show, and this is to emphasize this point that there's a mismatch currently between when the, when the urchins showed up versus when, say, sea stars and the, the like, sunflower stars died. This is information from right, this kelp bed right here. This is from Hopkins Marine Station. John Pearson, one of his uh, postdocs at the time, did this work where they were now starting in 1972 all the way up through 1981 with a couple of repeats in certain years where they basically annually surveyed urchins in these big rings out in the Hopkins kelp bed, if it was sunny, we could look right where they were studying, and they measured, you know, upwards of 50 to a couple hundred urchins every single year. And they got the measurements, and that's what these plots are. These plots show you how many individuals versus what size, going from 10 centimeters out to 70 centimeters, sorry, 10 millimeters, that would be really big urchin, uh, 10 millimeters out to 70 millimeters, okay? And what you're seeing is, and I'll help you see, with this red line, that there's this cohort that's moving through time. They're getting older and bigger every single year. And it took most of the individuals to go from about 10 millimeters, which is about as small as they could see without using pry bars and things, six years to get to 40 millimeters, okay? And a 40 millimeter urchin is not that big. We have 40 millimeter ones out here we get five, five, uh, sorry, five centimeter, six centimeter urchins now. So that took six years. So if we're seeing three, four, five centimeter urchins this year or last year, chances are they showed up not in 2013, but probably back in 2009, 2010. When they show, when they first show up, they're a couple of millimeters. They're tiny. They grow very fast initially, and then they start to sort of taper out as they get larger and larger. They have asymptotic growth. So here's Butterfly House. Uh, that's a poor stipe of a subcanopy kelp, probably pteridophora, that's just being mowed down by these urchins. We've got, these are some good size ones. A lot of these are in the, in the three centimeter size, but that this guy here is, you know, five centimeter. So here's, here's the quiz. I forgot to tell you there was going to be a quiz. <laughs> but here's the quiz. Is the observed increase in urchins caused by or coincident with the loss of sea stars by disease? Now I'll just tell you, remember the media was saying it was caused by. 
and we know what the media does, right? <laughs> they sometimes get a scientist story partially correct. So you don't have to answer it. If you want to know the answer, you can ask me later. But I, I'm hoping I provided you with the information for you to decide whether it's caused by these guys being lost or just happened to coincide with the fact that you lost these stars and a lot of these urchins were reaching a size already where they couldn't fit in cracks and crevices. They were getting obvious for, for folks to collect the data. And coupled with not the best kelp growth the last couple of years, and they need to swim around and get some food. So, I didn't want to end with just a bummer, so this is the palate cleansing, a couple of photos. <laughs> just to kind of go, there are still areas where we've got, this is Lobos uh, last week, where we've got healthy stars and, you know, sponges, and there's sub-canopy kelp, and there's kelp all over the place, and places like here, right here in the breakwater, even though I took this before we had that red tide coming and turn everything into, you know, English tea, but, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, we had nice kelp beds, sand dollars all along the bottom, and it looks pretty cool. So, we do have areas where we have some issues with urchins. The loss of sea stars is ubiquitous, but we do have some species that seem to have survived in low numbers, and it appears that there is some uh, recruitment going on, ongoing recruitment. The good news is we don't have to rely on local reproduction to restock our stuff. We can get larvae traveling up and down the California current and, and, the, and, the, and the counter current, the Davidson counter current, bringing larvae from north and south to repopulate these populations. And we've got a patchwork right now. We've got a quilt. Some spots are really great, seem to be doing just fine. Other places, not so much. They're a little more worn down. But there's a chance for them to come back in, in the ensuing years. So, I'll end there, say thanks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. You had your arm up? Or no? Me? Yeah. Jack, um, at the breakwater especially, we're seeing a lot more sand dollars. Is yeah. that the same thing that's happening with the so purchase? There's, there's Starting, I would say, like 2012 or so, maybe a little bit earlier, I have, to, I have to look back in my pictures and notes, but there's been a shift in a couple of things. We didn't used to have sea hares all over the place. I mean, when I was a grad student diving here, it was an exciting day to see a single sea hare. Now it's like I can kind of pick them up and I, mean, I can just walk along with them. There's so many of them. Brittle stars in certain areas have gone through the roof. There are areas where there you can't see the bottom because there's so many brittle stars. Um, sand dollars at the breakwater in front of in front of Hopkins on the on the west side uh, where we've got a, an experiment going. There's dense sand dollar bands where you never saw those to that extreme before. Um, are they related? Is it the weird sort of oceanographic conditions we've been having the last few years that have promoted recruitment of some of these species? Um, I think there, there are people who study those taxa that could probably provide insight in terms of, yeah, it makes sense that brittle stars under warm water conditions are actually having high recruitment. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't have that information at my fingertips, um, but I could easily envision a lot of scenarios that are related to the blob um, and the, you know, which is that warming event, you know, uh, I'm not saying the blob like the thing that you know, ate the whole town, you know, that I would watch black and white as a kid, go, oh, this blob thing. But, um, you know, the, the warm water anomaly that we had sitting off our coast in uh, 13, 14, and 15, end of 13 and, and through 15. And then we had the ENSO event on top of that. Um, we saw a lot of interesting, strange things happen with range, ranges of organisms from Southern California and Baja California, and even further south. So, temperature might be uh, facilitating some of these species in terms of their recruitment. Um, but, to my knowledge, no one's you know really looking at that causative agent. It's a hard thing to do to pin it because, like I said, we've got larvae coming from all over the place. 
Um, I'll go with you. Yeah, your honor. Um, I've seen this is the data on the review of the, I think it's the Central California region that was reviewed in 2015 for uh, the sanctuary. Yeah, so we had a condition right? report. Yeah, we yeah. have a condition report. Mm -hmm. And I understand there's a northern region and a southern region. Do, are they, if I understood what I read, in the sanctuary? Yeah, so the sanctuary, um, the sanctuary itself um, is managed by two entities. Um, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Office manages up to Año Nuevo. And then from Año Nuevo up to the, just past the Golden Gate, is managed by the um, Greater Farallon's office. And so we used, we used to just call it the Monterey Sanctuary in the Northern Management Area. The, the reason that happened was the people in kind of Half Moon Bay and North felt they were closer to San Francisco Bay, which I guess geographically that's true. <laughs> um, and so they wanted to be more with, they wanted Farallon's to manage it. So I was, I was thinking, hey, but less for us to do, more for them. You got Mavericks to deal with, good riddance. You know, that's, it's, it's a, that's a really a tough spot there. But from, a, from an administrative perspective, the laws are all the same within the sanctuary. It's just which office is managing which section. And that was done for basically political reasons. And I guess my question is, are those areas going to have a review also, like the central area came under review? Yes, yes. And that's... The Greater Fairlawns does that. Okay. Yeah, all the sanctuaries have a. Con what he's talking about is basically just like the EPA comes out periodically with a scorecard for how are the DDT levels doing, how pesticides, organic chlorides, all that kind of stuff. We have a report card every five years that comes out and says, here's how we think these various resources are doing in various habitats, offshore, nearshore, estuaries, etc. Yeah. Uh, in the back, yes. So, several questions. I'm curious. Some of us aren't divers. What is the technology that you use as you're going along and you have to pick from 70 different species, you have to determine its size and enter it into something, uh, and you have to be at a certain depth? Well, I mean, it's a simple question, but I'm just curious. What, what's used? It, it, is, it is the most powerful computer known to man. <laughs> <laughs> what, well, where, how do so, you record it? So, so the cool thing is... <laughs> Uh, let me, uh, I don't know if you saw that uh, when I was showing the divers, there's uh, an underwater, there's a slate, an underwater paper that we write on. Okay. So there's the slate that divers holding, uh, I think that's a she in her arm. And we have underwater paper that's pre-printed. So we've got a data sheet that has all the little names and the, the cells. And so all we have to do is just count and remember what we counted and then periodically do a data dump into those cells. And, and it's the simplest thing in the world if you know what you're looking for. That's the hard part. It's just like anybody can look at birds. Hell, I can see birds. Do I know what that little brown bird is? No, it's a little brown bird. I can't tell which little brown bird it is. So that's where we do two weeks of training to get people who have actually already taken invertebrate zoology, already taken kelp force ecology as an undergraduate, and have studied those things, and then I put them through the ringer and have to identify. You've got 70 species on that grid, and yes. you've got size as well to grid, you said. For fish, for fishes. Well, okay, yeah. how yeah. many, well, 33, whatever, so you so, scale, you so that's why I was saying we had that slalom yeah. course yeah. where you're constantly, and, we, and, the, and what you can't see on that slate is it's actually marked with rulers on it, so what we do is like, for example, I know that's 20 centimeters. Okay. My fist is 10 centimeters. Right, right. From here to there is one meter. We have a whole bunch of little tricks that we mm. basically teach our surveyors, along with having a slate with rulers on it. And I tell them, just because you pass the test doesn't mean you don't keep recalibrating. I say, I do that all the time. Sometimes I'll look and there's a fish sitting there I don't even bother estimating it. I look, where's the tail? Where's the head? Tail, head, tail, head. As I get closer, it swims off. I'm like, tail was there, head was there. I put my slate on it, and I measure it to the yes. centimeter. Can't always do that if they're swimming in the water column. So we, we try and do our best, but it, it's, it's a constant process of recalibrating 
every single dive. And all of us, the people who are veterans doing it, we have to take the test too. <laughs> there's no one who's, because it, it, it changes. And, and there's a whole bunch of things with the human mind and the eye and whether something's round or elongate. I can show you images and you go, oh, that one's bigger than that one. I'm like, they're exactly the same length. It's just because one's round and one's elongated that you think one's bigger than the other. So we, we deal with that. It's a good question because, and not everyone can do it. There are people who just, they don't get it. And we're like, guess what? You get to do inverts. <laughs> yes? Um, okay. Have you ever um, been on a survey and you're confusing purple and red or just because they look like a purple or can look very much like the red? Yeah, so. But hold on. Yeah. Do you think that there's any chance that they can cross? There, there are hybrids. Yeah, they can hybridize. The way that you, the way that ultimately tell. So this this is one of the reasons why um, this diver has the fingertips there. Um, even though we tell them not to molest the wildlife, for some things you have to. And so for urchin spines um, with your skin, because some. Red urchins look black, some look bright red, some look pink, some look almost a shade of purple. If you rub your finger on a spine and look at what it shows up on your skin, a red is always going to be like sort of a lipstick um, cabernet red. It won't be purple, whereas purple will be purple. So I tell them if you're really having a hard time, just touch them and rub your finger if they don't have um, fingertips on their gloves. Is that why you dive without gloves? I dive without gloves because um, when I started, George actually is the, is the reason, I'm going to blame George for this. I don't dive when, when, when George was my, my TA, I was an undergrad at UCLA and George was doing his PhD, and he was my TA out on Catalina Island for a whole quarter, and we got out there and I was relatively new to diving, and George would go out there and he goes, the water's great, I'm not going to wear a hood. And it'd be like 70 degrees, which for me at the time, I was like, this is really, really cold. And he would be out there with no glove, I mean, no hood and gloves, and he was showing us all this stuff and pointing things out. And I, I realized at the time, he would, you know, on land, or sometimes he'd ride underwater, he'd be saying something, and I couldn't get it because I had these big, thick neoprene gloves on. And after you dive for a while, 70 degrees is pretty balmy warm. You know, it's all relative. But um, so now the only time I wear gloves is if it's below 50. So I have to be in like Oregon or I was just up in Washington two months ago. And I wore gloves because it's 46 degrees. And, and that, that was cold. And, and the, the guys up there going, oh, this is warm. And I got, it's all relative, baby. Because the Alaskan guys are going, you are in the 40s? What? That's great. You know, you're not, you know they're, they're like, well, I wear finger gloves instead of the lobster gloves, you know, so it's all relative. And, and I, I do it for many reasons, but I just, I, I don't, I, my hands don't get cold. If I wear gloves, I'm definitely really warm, but I prefer the dexterity. I, I write a lot when I'm underwater, and I'm always touching things to try to determine, okay, is this a tunicate, is this a sponge, is it a bryozoan? Some things you can't really tell unless you touch them, so. Yes? So these surveyor jobs, are they seasonal, and uh, how many yeah. are there, and where do they come So from? everyone's always excited about doing that kind of thing. So the, so the way it works is um, there is a group of people who are year-round technicians um, that are hired through the university. They're university employees. They're usually people who have graduated and did like a year or two of volunteering and finally stuck around. So they get great, I'm getting paid 30000 a year, I made it, you know. They're only 23 years old, so they did make it, you know. Um, they don't know any better. Uh, but um, the vast majority now, because the funding's been cut so much, relies on volunteers. And so what, what we do is um, we train a bunch of people to do it. We usually get upwards of about 20 people every summer signing up. And we use maybe 10 of them. I would say about half of them because they actually have to get a job, you know, doing something or they already have a job or some other career, they can't commit to time. And what happens is these are five day a week from basically 4th of July until mid-October. Five day a week, you're on call. And a lot of people are doing three days out of those five. 
and it's usually two to four dives per day. And you're at the Santa Cruz lab at 6.30 in the morning, and you don't get back there until about 4.30 at night. And you just go home, sleep, and repeat. So I used to try and keep up, but the students are all staying the exact same age. Every year I get a new crop of 22-year-olds, and I keep getting older, so I can't keep up with them. Um, so, uh, so now I, I, I used to try and do three days a week or so and help out, but now it's, it's much less. But for folks who are always, we, we always have a, the availability of people to do it. It's just a matter of what's your commitment in terms of time. And um, that's, that's really a lot of people just can't commit that time and say, yeah, I'm basically an employee for the next three months, and I'm happy to do this. Or I work on Saturdays or something like that, and I make a ton of money. So there's not many people who are in that. They're like, if I make a ton of money and I only work Saturdays, I'm going to the, like, the tropics or something on a charter boat, you know, on a little board. So, yes? Um, yeah, I was wondering if there's a, a good organization called Beachcombers, and yeah. I've been able to find their data. Is it integrated into the Simon there? Yeah, so if you go into Simon, uh, we have a web page. We actually just migrated everything over to Moss Landing Marine Labs. And they have all the beachcomber data um, there and the reports. There are links through Simon to do that, but we just migrated because they're actively looking for funds and stuff. And, and we, because of the budget situation, just couldn't support them anymore. So it made more sense for them to be over on the Moss Landing side of things. But yeah, if you if you just even just type in beachcombers, you'll find both of those links. Do they have their data available? Like, like you guys they have, have great way they to have, data, but I've never heard They have some this. reports that are out that have, gra they don't have anything like an online graphing tool where you can say, yeah. show me oh, this bird nice. by this beach by this year, plot it. Yeah. There's nothing like those. We're cool. all working towards that, but yeah. it's it's difficult. And also, are you guys associated with Reef Check at all? Does yeah, so, so the protocols that Reef Check uses are a subset of the protocols that Pisco uses. So ReefCheck doesn't do everything that Pisco does, but um, the data that they collect are almost identical. There's a couple of slight differences. And the guy who, who's running California ReefCheck, Dr. Jan Freiwald, was just finishing, or I was just finishing up when he was doing his PhD, and we collaborate on a lot of things. So we work with both ReefCheck and Pisco and um, to a certain extent, reef as well, which is a very different methodology that they employ to collect fish data. But yeah, we we um, are open to using all those kinds of data. Yeah. Yes. Um, Pisco was diving before in the seventies and eighties. No, uh, started in, in ninety nine. Ninety nine. Yeah. So your work, were you involved also with the creation of the MPAs, the California MPA, helping to designate different? Area. The folks on, on Peace Goer and, and people on our staff were. I personally wasn't, um, but we had sanctuary representatives, federal representation during that state process, and a lot of the science that was derived for, in particular, the kelp force came from Peace Go data, and a lot of the intertidal work came from both Peace Go as well as a group called Marine, the Multi Agency Rocky Intertidal Network, which is a consortium of academic and um, government entities essentially funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy um, and Mineral Bone, one of this Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or something like that. It used to be MMS, Minerals Management Service. Yeah? Something uh, related to that. I mean, if you look at these MPA uh, lines, I mean, you just see that they're all, you know, jagged. How do they determine that? I mean, it's <laughs> briefly, Blood, briefly. blood sport. Um, remember, remember, you've got what you want to establish and what the state actually did, which is, is an excellent example of this, is you want a network of locations. You don't want to have, we're just going to protect this area and to hell with everywhere else. You want a network that's connected so that, like we were talking about, the larvae and the propagules from one place can hopefully help the other place. And there's, there's actually corridors of connection through currents. Now. How something actually gets plotted is oftentimes a function of what else is happening there. And this is really an exercise of what's called marine spatial planning. So our diagram just shows like the boundary of the sanctuary and the boundary of an MPA. I could add on layers of where are rockfish fishing areas, where are trawl areas, where are marine mammal protection areas, 
or in areas of special biological significance designated by the state for water quality. I mean, we can add 5 million layers, all of those interests competing for their own voice to be heard and why they do or don't want another layer of protection in that area, on top of all the extraction, other, you know, recreational fishing, for example. So those were all hammered out to first meet the needs of the network and to also try and balance that desire to have a healthy economy, which includes fishing, but also a healthy economy for non-extractive things like people who just want to sail or kayak or scuba dive and don't want to take anything. They just want to look. Mm -hmm. And so that's how a lot of those things get hammered out. And usually the locals had a lot of input in local areas. I mean, our peninsula, you know, we have from the Ricketts going right around, P, you know, Monterey to PG into Pebble Beach, there was a lot of that, you know, advocacy for certain levels of protection there because there's a lot of people living right here on the peninsula. And not as much in Big Sur because there's not a lot of people in Big Sur. So, you know, if we had as many people living in Carmel, PG, and Monterey and Pebble Beach living in Big Sur on that coastline, there'd be a lot, I think the, the, the seascape would be different in terms of how many MPAs are down there. And we also had Big Creek was a pre-existing MPA. We also, remember, these were all created de novo. Many of these were pre-existing marine protected areas through some other act or agency, and they were trying to kind of, let's get everyone under the same umbrella. 